Uh, good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, I usually tell members to switch their mobile phones off. I think I'm going to now extend that up invitation to our invited guests and very warm welcome to everyone here this morning. But the first item on our agenda is to decide whether to item three in private. Are the members of the committee agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Our next item is to take evidence on the EU withdrawal bill in a round table format and we're joined for this discussion by Simon Collins, who is the executive officer of the Scottish Fishermen Federation, Kate Houghton, the planning policy and practice officer of the Royal Twining Planning Institute, Isabel Mercer, who's a policy officer at RSPB Scotland, Robin Parker, the public affairs manager at WWF Scotland, Dr. Serafin Pazos Vidal of the head of Brussels office of COSLA, Professor Colin Reid, Professor of Environmental Law at University of Dundee, Claire Slipper, who is the Political Affairs Manager at NFU Scotland, and Daphne Velastari, who is the Ad Advocacy Manager at Scottish Environment Link. That's a lot of names. Um, uh, and uh, welcome to one and all. I, I can I suggest that when you first open up your first contribution, those who are here for the first time, just give us your name at the beginning. So just for record purposes, and, the, uh, and I can't see all the nameplates from where I'm sitting, so that will help me too. Um, the round table will be structured around five themes, which I intend to around uh, about 20 minutes for each theme. We'll invite internal particip participants to initiate the discussion in each theme by outlining their views on it. And then we'll, uh, then we'll and do that in turn with all of the themes. Now, inevitably, it's going to be a free, as a part of a free-flowing discussion one theme may well lead into another, and we're going to be flexible about this. I realise that's the case. Um, and we'll, we'll try to manage it as best as we can. But if you can just catch the eye, either myself or the clerks, if you want to contribute, please feel free to do so. But I'm just going to try and let the, let it flow rather than, if we can, we can do it that way, rather than me guiding it the whole way. That would be incredibly helpful. So, the first theme for discussion is current arrangements in the European Union. And I invite Daphne Vlastari of the Scottish Environment Link to provide an overview of her views on this topic. Daphne, so this is over me. to you. Good morning. Thank you very much for having us today. Yeah. Um, while this is a rather big topic, I thought I would look at it at least from the environmental sort of protection side and the legislation that pertains to that, and perhaps others can speak to uh, points from their sectors. Um, I think as far as Scottish Environment Link members are concerned, um, the EU has been um, the key mechanism through which we have had environmental protection legislation in Scotland and across the UK. I think the figure that is usually quoted is that about 80% of the environmental protections that we enjoy today um, are because of EU-derived law. Um, so there is a clear need and a clear ask on behalf of our members to retain these protections as we move forward in terms of the UK's exit from the EU. And there's also a clear need to convert faithfully through the withdrawal bill those um, pieces of EU legislation um, and give them the status of primary law, which means that they cannot be amended by a secondary legislation going forward. Um, there's been obviously there's this is a huge task in terms of ensuring that our environmental laws are converted into domestic law of course we've got some directives that are already incorporated in scots law but there's also regulations council decisions so it's really a complex matrix um, of legislation that we have uh, today in scotland and across the uk um, so it's not uh, a very easy task i understand that the scottish government at the moment is looking at which pieces of eu legislation will be affected by the uk's exit from the eu and I think DEFRA has already issued um, some numbers in terms of uh, pieces of legislation that will be affected. They estimate that about 150 pieces of EU legislation will be affected and that we will need about 100 um, statutory instruments to ensure that we have um, a correct statute book. So those numbers can help inform discussions in Scotland as well. Um, 
the other aspect to highlight in terms of how EU environmental law works today is that um, we have some clear guiding principles enshrined in the treaties. So the treaties clearly say that we should be working towards a more sustainable um, world, uh, towards sustainable development, and that legislation as far as environment, but also public health and safety, should be based on some key um, international principles of environmental law, which are the precautionary principle, polluter pays, and so on. So these principles are found quite commonly in international um, conventions. You know, you can look at the Rio summit or you can look at climate change. Um, but what the EU treaties provide is essentially create um, a legal requirement for those principles to be taken into account when we develop legislation at the EU level. So it's very important for us that those principles are preserved as we go forward. The other aspect of EU law is that um, different EU bodies um, in coordination with uh, functions that are actually um, taken forward at the domestic level uh, have enabled for a robust sort of implementation and enforcement of EU law. So obviously there's been times where different governments or um, other actors have not been fully implementing EU laws. Um, at the EU level, we have the relevant functions to ensure that um, the Commission can monitor when this is not happening or be alerted when this is not happening and take appropriate action when needed. Um, and this is a, a process that allows for much wider sort of concerns to be raised compared, for instance, to what we have um, in Scottish and UK law with a judicial review. Um, so we do feel that there will be uh, very likely a governance gap as we move forward, and this is something that we would need to look into. A last point to make is that there's been a lot of discussion in Scotland, but also across the UK, about the importance of maintaining our international ambitions and continuing bar being part of international agreements, and that is absolutely very welcome. But what it is very important to highlight is that the way we have actually implemented our international commitments as the UK is primarily via our membership of the EU. So this has been very true for Scotland, of course. Um, so the negotiating sort of position of the UK as a whole has been developed at the EU level, and it's through EU mechanisms that we have been able to um, sort of implement those international obligations. So assuming that the commitment of the UK government and the Scottish government um, sort of continues to apply, which we are sure um, is true in terms of maintaining international ambitions, we would have to replicate some sort of domestic mechanisms to ensure that this continues um, in the future. So that's for okay. me. Right. I'm just going to, to get the ball rolling. Can I just ask a question on one of the, uh, uh, the aspects that you raised? And what I'm very keen to try to do is to get some practical examples of some of the things that you say as part of the, the evidence so we can build that into our, our, our report for when, when it comes. Um, and you mentioned the issue of general principles of international law. And I noticed, Robin Parker, from the evidence provided by RSPB, that you say, uh, and as part of that evidence that you provided to us, the bill does not provide sufficient clarity that these principles were converted alongside other EU law. This is critical because environmental legislation, including any jointly agreed frameworks between the UK government and the devolved administrations, is applied and developed correctly in the future. I just wonder if you... Can we go towards Isabel on that? Sorry, sorry Isabel, not Robin. Apologies. <laughs> Why did I think you were ISPB, Robin? It's WWF. You, 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 <laughs> sorry, Isabel. On, yes. Apologies. No problem at all. Would you like to take, would you like to take that one on? So... Could you just repeat the actual question again? Yeah, the, it says in some of the evidence you provided, and no wonder you're asking me to do it again, given I didn't address it to the right person in the first place. The general principles in, in international law. There's a bit of your evidence that says the bill does not provide sufficient clarity that these principles will be converted alongside other EU law. This is critical to ensure environmental legislation, including any jointly agreed frameworks between the UK governments and devolved administrations, applied and develop correctly in the future. I just wonder if you could expand on that and give us like, some examples of what you actually mean by that. That would be helpful. Yeah, so I think, um, uh, as well, at RSPB Scotland, um, I think there's a few key points about the principles, um, one being the interpretation of retained EU law, because at the moment those principles which are articulated in the EU treaties um, play a key role in the interpretation of European legislation, and 
that should continue once that law has been brought over. And the second point is about um, the creation of future environmental legislation in the UK. So at present in the EU, um, all legislation that's created is based upon those kind of founding principles. And we would obviously expect that that would continue for any future environmental legislation that was created within the UK and any of the UK countries. And that would include um, creation of any new common frameworks across the UK um, should kind of have those founding principles at their heart. So to give a bit of context, um, one of the principles that Daphne mentioned was the precautionary principle. Um, so an example where that's been utilised in EU legislation was um, in the banning of neonicotinoids, um, which are harmful pesticides that affect bees. Um, and so um, they were basically uh, banned on the basis of the precautionary principle because um, there could, there wasn't, it wasn't proven that there was no risk to the bees. So at that time, there wasn't conclusive evidence that it was affecting colony populations. Um, however, the use of neonicotinoids was outlawed on the basis that there wasn't conclusive proof that they, they did prove harm, if you see what I mean. Um, so, so that's kind of one example of, of where those principles have been used to, um, to bring environmental protections. And, we, and what do you think the bill needs to be improved then, to give it the clarity that it's been sought? So I think at the moment our, our position is that it's, there just isn't clarity about whether and how those principles are exactly going to be brought over. So we've, we've had advice that it may be um, that where those principles have been interpreted in, in um, CJU case law, they would be brought over. Um, however, yeah, it's just not clear at the moment. Okay. Uh, Robin, you do want to contribute this thing. Yeah, I just thought uh, Isabel better get in first. Um, yeah, just, just to add, it's, it's because these um, principles, these environmental principles, are in the treaties rather than in the in the body of EU law. So it's the the withdrawal bill is very clear about how you know, it, it directives, existing laws, EU laws are all brought over, but it doesn't bring the EU treaties over. And now there's obviously lots of parts of the EU treaties which don't, you know, it wouldn't make sense to bring into into domestic law. But as I think Isabel's outlined very well, that they, these environmental principles in particular are very closely ingrained. They're a part of the environmental legislation, all that environmental legislation that we have been operating here in Scotland needs those principles because they're an integral part. So they need to be brought over as one, but it's simply because they come from a different place in the treaties that kind of the withdrawal bill hasn't sucked them over. Okay, does anybody else want to make some comment on this? Oh, Simon? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Simon Collins, um, Scottish Fishermen's Federation. Um, we would have not, we'd have no, obviously no problem with retaining principles ex clearly expressed in whatever is retained or rolled over from the EU. I, but I think you, you becomes no surprise um, that we're less enamoured of EU law generally and the fisheries side. Um, the management, well, there's two parts to it, if I can explain maybe from the fisheries point of view, to what the current arrangement is. The EU has sort of two roles. One is is that it acts as what's termed a coastal state, so it negotiates quota on behalf of member states, including ourselves. That's one part, of course, which will disappear. The other part is the management um, part. And underneath this great mass of EU legislation, we have principles to which we could all agree, but an enormous mass of inertia and even regulations that made sense and invented. It's extremely difficult um, through co-management to change those things. We're looking for a far more flexible management system. So whatever is transferred across and whatever is retained after exit is very, very important that while we respect the principles, we don't get bogged down in the kind of inertia and the cumbersome mechanisms that we had in the past. It's um, just as an aside, um, it's interesting how often we're told about the common fisheries policy and how successful it has been in, in, in saving fish stocks. And I find it remarkable that the only place where it seems to have worked is Scottish waters. It certainly hasn't worked anywhere, worked anywhere else, which makes you think, is there something we've been doing differently in Scotland? as opposed to the rest of the EU. And yes, there are things we've been doing differently, totally aside from the or out with the EU, and we continue to do that. And we have a great success in a number of stocks already that we all know about. So we're looking for a far more reactive management system. So it's very important when we transfer principles across, we don't get too excited about the massive detail. It really hasn't produced the kind of reactive system that a dynamic ecosystem needs. Thanks, Daphne? Because I think you were looking also at 
how can we practically address this issue of principles? And I think Colin made the point about, you know, when we go into the details, and of course there are plans for reviewing some pieces of EU legislation, but it's very good to hear that you would be generally, in principle, agreeing with the principles. Um, but to your point about how do we sort of convert that, I think um, as part of a wider sort of UK alliance of NGOs, we are proposing specific amendments to the withdrawal bill, um, and these would place a duty on public bodies to bear in mind those principles. Um, so just as Robin was saying, obviously there's no intention as you exit the EU to bring all the EU treaties in, but um, there needs to be some sort of uh, acknowledgement and reference to those principles if we are to make um, policy in the right way going forward. Serafin? Um, just a compliment on that, Serafin Pathos from COSLA. Um, uh, specifically on international obligations and, and general outcomes rather than just general principles. Um, I think we have a I don't want to start like being pessimistic, but we have a pessimistic early indicator that might be a bit challenging uh, to do that in terms of the current culture in settling in Westminster, but also perhaps here in Scotland. Um, I'm specifically referring to the Sustainable uh, Development Goals, which are very, very wide international uh, outcomes in terms of environmental sustainability that go well beyond the EU as well, and that the UK has signed, and the Scottish Government, the First Minister, has committed to implement in Scotland, but compared to many other countries in Europe and other parts of the world, this has not yet started really, whereas in other countries it's very much advanced. So uh, it's just an early indication that uh, while we will like to have just general, um, um, abide into general global principles as the UK being a kind of a global, 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 global partner for stability, uh, there's going to be uh, likely a, a cultural resistance to get into much sort of commitments on that level. And I, as you know as well, we have concerns about the fact that the UK has not ratified in any way in, the, in Scotland or in the UK as a whole uh, the Charter for Local Self Government, which is a treaty that the UK has agreed. So that's early indication, but I hope it's just been too pessimistic. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to contribute on that issue of the international law at this stage? Any other members want to ask a question or make a point? Patrick, I can see you. I mean, I suppose there's a, a comparison with other attempts to place principles uh, into law that constrain uh, the actions of, of governments. Uh, the most obvious example would be, you know, we have a, a long-standing principle on the, the Sewell Convention that the UK government won't legislate in devolved areas without the devolved parliament's consent. Um, we can see how much the attempt to place that onto a statutory basis is worth now. So there's a, a real question about in the absence of a written constitution that would constrain what governments are allowed to do and how they may legislate in future, there's a real question about whether there's any way in which we can place a constraint uh, on ministers to apply these kind of environmental principles to the future development of law. Um, I'm wondering if anyone can find an example uh, in, the, in the UK context of a successful way of constraining uh, ministerial actions or, or future legislation, except for international treaties. Human Rights Act. Okay. Human Rights Act. Human Rights Act. Well, if, if people want to pick up... Uh, on, sorry. sorry. First, first Colin Professor, Reed, Colin. Dundee University. Accepting what you say about constraining, there may still be a value in enshrining the principles in some extent, as it means they are relevant considerations that the government ministers can't be said, no, you can't think about that you can't alter your economic goals to take account of environmental or other purposes. If they are there as something that has to be taken account of, at least they can get onto the table, the ministers have to listen to them, which isn't the same as a constraint, but may still be achieving something. Okay. Just, uh, right, Robin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to add, add to that as well, I think, so if, if the purpose, and I think we're skipping ahead in the agenda here, but the purpose of the EU withdrawal bill is to, is a, as a kind of a, a salvage operation, as it were, of bringing across EU law as it currently works in Scotland and the UK and, and bring it across into domestic legislation, then I think why, why these capital P environmental principles uh, are really important to bring across with these amendments that have, have been proposed. And incidentally, don't have yet any Scottish MPs supporting those amendments. We would love it. There's not any Scottish MPs here, obviously, but maybe there's some listening. They get on board, that'd be great. Um, so. The other thing I was going to add was that they, they don't 
as they function at the moment, they don't just have um, an applicability on, on ministers. There are things that can be referred to in, in legal cases. So um, I, I'm afraid I don't have an example from Scotland with me, but it's, um, we can maybe come back to the committee with some, some ex further examples. But there's an example here um, that Green UK, the body we've been working on at Westminster on this, uh, have from Northern Ireland uh, in an incident where in Loch Ney, um, you had a company illegally taking sand out of the lock, and uh, what happened was that the, minute, the environmental minister in the Northern Ireland administration said, um, you know, uh, what's the exact phrasing? They issued an enforcement notice say, telling the companies to stop. And then what happened was um, Friends of the Earth um, used, uh, said that because they didn't order an immediate um, halt to the activities while it could be further investigated whether this was having an impact on the habitats in the lock, um, that the minister had failed to use the precautionary principle and that was what they argued in court and it was on the basis of that precautionary principle that um, the court reached its judgment in saying that there should have been a, a halt to the activities while further investigation was taken. So that's just to say that at the moment those environmental principles with a capital P um, have a force beyond just simply informing other law and so on. They can be referred to in, in a legal setting. And so if we're, what we're trying to do at the first instance is simply bring them across, keep things working as they are, which is what I understand the principle of the EU withdrawal bill to be. We need to do as much of that salvaging as possible. And then later on, we can have that, that conversation that, that, that Simon started about whether it's the right thing that should work for Scotland in that way, whether we can improve upon it, whether we can develop it in different ways. But the purpose of the EU withdrawal bill should be to keep things as far as possible as they are. Um, th th these principles, um, you're right to say, I think, are drawn from um, uh, provisions in the treaty, but they are given life, as you've just illustrated, um, not by the treaty, but by court decisions, um, or indeed decisions by regulators. Um, and isn't it um, already contained within the withdrawal bill that um, the general principles of community law, as they used to be called, general principles of EU law, um, that have been given um, life in uh, court decisions, either of the Court of Justice in Luxembourg or of any court or tribunal in uh, any of the legal jurisdictions of the United Kingdom will continue to have force uh, in the legal systems of the United Kingdom after exit day. So isn't this, isn't this a problem that's already been solved in the bill? Quite right. This is this is the case for existing ECJ rulings. There will be recourse to that, and where the ECJ rulings to specific cases and specific law, existing laws, where there's reference to the principles there, that would be the case. The point that we're trying to make is that that specific ruling would apply to a specific piece of legislation in a rather narrowly defined way, as it should for that specific legal case. The principles as they are enshrined today in EU treaties mean that they are broadly applicable. So in the future, should um, a crisis arise, should there be a new policy decision to be made, you would still need to have recourse to these principles. The ECJ rulings in and of themselves would not allow for that because they are much more limited in scope. So for example, to give you know, something that is quite different, do you remember the Nordic, uh, I think the Norwegian, sorry, a volcano that erupted? Um, I will not even attempt to pronounce the name of it, but it was on the basis of the precautionary principle that the flights were halted. Icelandic, Icelandic yeah. yes, sorry, correct. Um, and it was obviously something that impacted the um, entire uh, of the EU with the flights, and there was a lot of backlash at the time saying, you know, why did you do this? It was overly precautionary. And in the end, it turned out that this was the right decision because actually it would have severely affected, you know, flights coming in. So this is just an instance of where, you know, there was... Are you saying that that decision could not be taken for um, UK airports or UK airlines? Because there's some ruling, in, there's some provision of the of the withdrawal bill that means that the UK regulators would no longer be able to take that decision. Well, I think what I'm saying is that there was a much more direct course of action there because of the fact that the principles were enshrined in EU treaties. And I think what we would like is the same sort of confidence and certainty moving forward across the UK. Right. Okay. I'd like to move this on to the, something else that you also raised in your opening remarks, Daphne, about the policy for it framework that exists within the European Union. I noticed it was one of the strong themes that came from the evidence from all sides about you know, that we've currently got a policy-making framework within the European Union. 
and, and some concerns were being expressed by the evidence presented to us that there may be a, a risk of that process and how it's evolved and some of the certainty that comes from it and the regulation that comes from it being lost. Others see there's an advantage in to, to be able to change policy in future. So I'd like to just understand a bit more about that. Um, I, so I don't know who'd like to pick up on that particular element before I leave this theme. Simon? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, for, for us, um, it's, we, we certainly don't want a legal vacuum. Nobody does. Um, for that reason, um, the withdrawal bill for us is, is we, we, we accept the reasons of time. We, we, can, we, we see where Dexu and DEFRA are coming from in the UK about the need for this as a necessary first step. We'd entirely agree with that. The question for us is what happens afterwards. As a fishing industry, we've always been very keen on devolution. The closer management is to where the people are actually fishing to the fishing grounds, the more likely it is to work, and the more likely it is we'll be able to meet the objectives that are set higher up, if you like, the principles over which we would not disagree. Um, the question then it comes is how do we ensure that that devolution of powers passes smoothly after or through the withdrawal bill? And of course, that's just something we're going to come on to in a minute. Um, there's just, as I've mentioned before, there are two parts to the EU competence that, that concern us here in fisheries right now. One is the EU acting as a coastal state and negotiating on our behalf. That comes to the UK. That's a natural place for it. And we're very happy with that, as long as there's an arrangement within the devolved administrations to make sure the, e the UK does speak for everybody. Um, the devolved fisheries management, we're very, very keen on it. If the withdrawal bill itself doesn't pass those powers through quickly enough, which is our concern, we'd like to see some mechanism to make sure that happens. We suggest that might be an amendment if there's some other mechanism where brighter brains and ours can figure it out to achieve the same aim. It's the outcome we're interested in, not the particular point of legal scruple, if you want. We'd like to get the devolution of powers through it. We see the withdrawal bill is probably the necessary first step. We accept that, but it's only the first step. Well, Simon's taken us naturally into the next bit of the process anyway as part of that, but if people want to touch, you know, touch on that issue, but also the, the policy framework that currently exists, because there's certainly a, there's a theme that came through to me that there's a fear that some of that could be lost in terms of decision making. So, but is anybody, uh, uh, RSPB I think reflect on that as well, Isabel, do you want to say anything about it? Um, we, we naturally have fears that there may be gaps in environmental protections as a result of the legislation being brought over. Um, I can go over some of the kind of key concerns we have with the actual bill in a minute when I um, give an introduction to that. Um, I think a kind of headline point to make would be um, the kind of really highlighting some of the benefits that that EU framework has provided for environmental protections. So, for instance, if you're thinking about the Birds and Habitats Directive, and the protections that that gives to um, priority species and habitats in the UK and across the EU. Um, we, one of the reasons why we think it's so key that that's brought over in its entirety is not only the protections that it provides for the environment, but also the regulatory stability that that's provided for businesses and developers. And the refit of the Birds and Habitats Directives that was carried out by the European Commission last year clearly showed strong evidence about the, those benefits that have been provided in terms of a level playing field and limiting um, competitive deregulation across the, the EU. And we would we believe that it's really imperative that that will continue um, to operate in the same way, even once we're outside of the European Union. And why won't it? Sorry? Why, why won't it? Because of the withdrawal bill. That's a bit I'm, I'm struggling to understand. The regulatory stability, why wouldn't it still be there? So I guess that's where I might start, if it's OK, yeah, to, start, to go right. into it. Yeah. Um, so we have kind of three main concerns with the bill as currently drafted. Um, some of them have already been touched touched upon by Daphne, so I won't go into them in a lot of detail. The first one is the issue of environmental principles, which has already been discussed. The second one is the governance gap issue, which is quite key um, when it comes to this stability. And this is about the kind of effectiveness of um, Im implementation of environmental le legislation and yeah. ensuring enforcement and compliance. Um, so this has to do with the kind of really key role, and again, Daphne's already touched upon this, but I'll go into a bit more detail the key role that EU bodies and institutions have played in the enforcement compliance, but also things like monitoring and reporting requirements when it comes to environmental legislation. Um, so things, mechanisms that are currently provided by the Commission and the Court of Justice don't currently exist in a domestic context in exactly the same way as they do um, in the European context. 
And we're concerned that with the loss of those kind of oversight and accountability mechanisms, even if the entire body of EU environmental legislation is brought over as it is, they won't operate as effectively as they do at present. Um, so that's kind of one of the key things that we're really interested in looking to solutions to that issue. And we don't feel that the bill at present um, currently provides for all of those functions to be replicated in a domestic context. Um, and then I guess our final point comes to the scope and scrutiny of powers conferred in the bill, and this is obviously something that will be discussed quite a bit today. Um, but to touch upon it, we do feel that um, the scope of the powers is extremely broad, has been brought up by many different stakeholders across many different sectors, um, and that there will be an insufficient level of parliamentary scrutiny um, on some of the regulations that are going to be created underneath, under the bill. And we're concerned that as a result, there is the potential that the bill could lead to what we would consider being um, non-technical changes as opposed to technical changes um, being made, that is, substantive policy changes. We do feel that the powers that are conferred in the bill at the moment do kind of give the scope for ministers to make more substantive policy changes um, without the correct level of parliamentary scrutiny. So much of that. Alexander, uh, thank you. Um, you, you mentioned uh, yeah, gaps in the bill, um, but there, yeah, there have also been gaps in EU legislation. I'm thinking particularly of the uh, soils directive, which never happened. Yeah, what, I just wonder what thought you've been given to the frameworks and moving forward, how those frameworks would uh, work for future uh, yeah, opportunities like soil, soil directive. Yeah, so I think, again, the starting point for us, our immediate priority is ensuring that <coughs> The, the frameworks that do currently exist under the EU arrangements are carried over. Um, and then, you know, at some future date, we can look at how to improve those frameworks. But I think really the kind of immediate priority is looking at ensuring there's no weakening in current protections. And that's been our focus and that's our starting point. Um, I think if you're starting to think about areas where we might need common frameworks across the UK in the future um, regarding environment, um, there's so much uncertainty regarding our kind of future relationship with the European Union and what kind of frameworks might be included in a deal that we don't feel that at this time it's kind of really worthwhile looking into specific areas and we'd be more interested in looking at the process of how those frameworks are developed across the UK countries in a way that is going to be kind of agreed fairly and jointly between all four countries so that they're not kind of being imposed. We feel that that would lead to more smoothly functioning legislation that's going to be complied with better. So that's kind of where we're coming from on those issues. One of the issues you raised was potential less oversight and enforcement. Uh, again, I want to try to get some practical examples of this stuff. I think the suggestion was that the structures that may exist in the UK in the future will not be the same as the structures that exist in the EU. So can you give us, Isabel, if you can, or somebody else, um, a, a, a bit more detail of a practical example about where that might be. So, what um, that might look like. Yep. So, I guess some, some examples where we feel that EU oversight has been particularly in, integral in ensuring environmental protection. Um, one, for instance, would be something like um, there's been uh, a lot of burning of blanket bog across um, special areas of conservation in England. And this has been occurring um, with the knowledge of the UK authorities, but what should have happened is that there's, um, there should have been an appropriate assessment carried out because of the um, framework that's um, given by the, um, nature direct the Habitats Directive. There should have been an appropriate assessment carried out for the burning on those areas, and it hasn't been. So what's now happened is that the European Commission is taking action to ensure that the UK authorities do take appropriate action. Um, and so in that instance, what the European Commission is providing is a kind of free forum for citizens and organisations to bring a complaint about how a member state is implementing environmental legislation within their country. And we don't feel at the moment that such forum exists within the domestic arrangements. I don't know if somebody else wants to add some more examples. Can, can, can I ask a follow-up question on that? I mean, this is incredibly helpful, and it's yes. exactly the kind of level of detail that I think, that I think we need to try, to try and understand. Um, uh, if you're right um, that uh, the bill as um, currently drafted opens up a regulatory gap, something which is currently regulated um, at EU level, um, isn't being transposed into the domestic legal arrangements of the United Kingdom, what kind of 
remedy do you propose to that? What kind of amendment to the, to the bill do you think would be necessary in order to plug that, that gap that you've identified? So there are specific amendments that have been drafted by Green UK and laid. Um, I don't have those amendments with me, but I can, can in, yeah, ensure that we get them to the committee. Contribute, Stefan. Let's call the colleague from from RSPB. I mean, the the, the, the Act. Uh, of course, we, we admit the necessity to have an Act to basically reverse the European Communities Act, which is what this is about. The problem is that the UK is not what it was in 1973, uh, and therefore the the, the 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 bill, in its simplicity, or is in not as very general in substance, but in, in for, formal, is very simple. Is doesn't provide sufficient guarantees about how you actually can develop UK-wide frameworks, domestic sub-UK sub, sub frameworks and international obligations. I mean, it, some members just say, why not? Well, it, it can well be that the current, that the current uh, bill, as it stands, can, might work well if everybody is reading it, reading it the same way and we, there is like a same understanding of what it means across the UK. Clearly, that's something that is uh, increasingly not the case in the UK as it currently stands. Um, this for, for, you, for you matters intergovernmental inter co coordination, uh, there has been a lot of informal arrangements and has been in some cases very exquisite respect from the UK level to the different provisions of uh, the Wolf administration, different policies. Uh, but there's always been informal and has been basic on the basic principle that the, in the case of Scotland, uh, it's very clear what the Scotland exclusive competence is. It's actually rather unique in all the 60 plus devolved administrations in Europe uh, that, that they have such clarity. So therefore, there was a, a, a trust that could have built and, and a culture of intergovernmental uh, inter relations. It is questionable that the current climate exists at the moment, that we can just assume this simplicity in the bill, the lack of uh, detail, legal detail that provides at the moment uh, will continue. Uh, just mention a number of examples of uh, gaps, regulation and enforcement gaps. Um, just coming back to not environmental issues, but competition issues, uh, state aid. Uh, it is not clear to us, for instance, whether the state aid guidelines, which tells what a public authority can give up a subsidy or not, is covered within the scope of the bill. Maybe we are wrong, but we, we don't see that there. Because for start, this is not a legally binding uh, second piece of secondary legislation. Most of the guidance of the European Commission, which is at the moment the regulator um, and enforces at EU wide level on state aid issues, uh, is some sort of political guidance, if you want. Uh, so it's not clear the extent of what the current state aid bodies will actually be incorporated through the repeal of uh, the withdrawal Dua bill. In terms of enforcement bodies, uh, we believe that the, the current uh, I mean, the UK has changed after we, with the EU. The UK has changed because of the evolution. But also, perhaps now we need to consider whether Westminster as a whole needs to change as a result of these changes. Uh, we cannot just assume that we can have UK bodies, for instance, on competition, uh, and if we have that as a UK government body. We can have UK-wide bodies, and the question is how to, to build this framework, because we cannot be in a position that one level of government can be both jury and party on an issue, for instance, competition policy or state aid. Thank you. Simon, do you want to still contribute at this, at this stage, Cam, before we move on to the next? Yeah, just yeah. a quick comment. You asked earlier on, Chair, about um, a specific examples or concrete examples of how things work and, how, and what you might do. Um, a number of us, and certainly in fisheries, have the, un, the very unhappy experience of going to the Commission often to, to ask for this and that, or, or improvements in fisheries policy at the very technical level, and having the extremely frustrating experience to have unelected officials in the lovely Berlimont building in, in Brussels saying this can or this cannot be done with an immediate and significant impact on Scottish businesses. And then us going back to our friends in the European Parliament and say, can you question this individual and get them to either them or even their superiors and to justify the decision you have made? And the answer is no, sadly, Simon, we cannot. It's for us. And this comes from not just Scottish MEPs, but other friends we have in other countries. No, it's a continual frustration. We cannot question that individual about that decision, indeed, or about a whole range of decisions. Now, that at least, so just to put it in perspective, I'm not, I'm not a, an apologist for the bill, I, I didn't draft it, um, but surely in the UK and in Scotland, you'd be in a better position than that, that if you so wish, Scottish ministers, Scottish civil servants, you can ask them and they should have to come. And I'm sure that exists already. And we don't have that now. Okay, Robert. 
Captain Tomkins' question about um, improvements to the bill. So I think the, the one particular thing is that the, the withdrawal bill currently says uh, it gives powers to ministers, and again, not 100% clear whether it's UK ministers or UK and Scottish ministers, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, power to assign functions that are to do with governance and scrutiny, enforcement, and so on, to existing uh, public bodies and so on. But uh, a very simple change that, that could be made would be um, requiring ministers to, to do that and to remove the power that is, exists within the withdrawal bill is introduced, which um, allows them to abolish some of those um, current requirements. So if, if the bill is about kind of providing continuity, then requiring those changes to be made is really important. Uh, and then the second thing I was going to say is that I think it's not, there is a kind of an immediate issue in terms of improving the bill but then there's the longer term question of where, you know, how can we develop better things for the future? Does it require new bodies um, to be created from scratch and so on? Um, and I think another practical example I'd... Um, Sorry, but you wouldn't expect to see that in this bill? No, not no. in this bill. I think no. th this bill is about... The, the, I think, as I understand it, the amendment simply says ministers must find people to do that in the minute. Um, I think there has also been a suggestion around a kind of a sunset clause around only allowing that kind of interim arrangements for, for a certain period of years and then requiring ministers to, after that, have found a long-term solution for those kind of things. Um, just to, again, give a, a practical example in terms of how the one of, one of the roles of the, that the Commission has been able to do in terms of the, the UK and, indeed, Scotland has been um, to kind of act as a prod before things get in fully into the, into the legal process. So um, the Commission was able to sort of... Um, rattle the sabre, as it were, for example, around uh, the implementation of um, clean air, um, clean air directives in in the UK, and that um, pushed um, the UK government towards bringing out um, new clean air, air plans. Um, and I, I think it has been part of that kind of backdrop of the Commission being like, we need to look closer at clean air, has has also been one of the pressures that has um, pushed the Scottish government similarly towards it rising up the agenda, rising up the kind of the political agenda, it providing greater um, attention within Parliament also to the issue. Okay, Thanks. that's a good, helpful to get these examples. Any members want to say any more about the policy framework before we move on to repatriation of powers area? In which case, sorry, Daphne, Daphne you got some else? Yeah. Just because you mentioned specific examples, I think we've touched uh, quite a bit on the judicial aspect and the legal aspect. Of course, when we're talking about enforcement and monitoring, there's the more mundane tasks of actually collecting data, publishing the data. Uh, so, of course, there are questions raised there whether um, there has been due consideration has been given to whether or not the UK as a whole would like to um, continue being a member of things like the European Environmental Agency or the European Chemicals Agency, you know, which collect a lot of data that, of course, a lot of British industry as well has invested in, in sort of pulling together. Um, so I think this is something that also needs to be potentially looked at. And of course, the final outcome will really depend on, you know, how the Brexit negotiations go and also what is the uh, future arrangement between the EU and the UK, because, you know, that might be part of the um, final negotiating um, sort of agreement. Uh, but I think what we would like to do is, as Robin correctly pointed out, we want to see a duty on ministers to assign those important functions to domestic bodies or to look into the possibility of creating new bodies where existing bodies cannot actually, you know, kind of perform these functions um, uh, within the, the bill, but also a firm commitment from the governments of the UK that this will be looked at, um, particularly the legal and infringement aspect that the EU currently performs cannot be replicated either through the UK or the domestic Scottish uh, legal system because of the limits of judicial review. So it's, I think it's quite important. Daphne, you know, I'm quite keen on practical examples. Give me a practical example of a new body that might be required to be created in the UK or Scotland as a result of leaving the European Union. So I yeah. understand this. So you could potentially consider a variety of bodies depending on what functions you would like to assign to them. You could consider um, expanding the role of the JNCC in terms of connecting, uh, collecting and collating and publishing data. You could consider the development of environmental courts in Scotland or similar bodies across the UK. You could have an environmental commissioner or ombudsman that would um, sort of take up complaints by citizens, businesses, stakeholders regarding the implementation of EU retained law. Um, there's a whole host of options. Um, and I think at the moment, it's much more 
helpful to look in terms of functions that different bodies could perform so that we can be as effective as possible in terms of assessing which existing bodies um, across the UK but also in Scotland could perform those roles and whether there are any gaps. That wouldn't be necessarily dealt with within, within the legislation that's currently in front of us, the EU withdrawal bill. That could be a part of the discussion that follows that, that process. And you know, the Environment Act, which is going to come through the Europe, which will come through Westminster as well, would it? Yes, yeah, so of course there's a discussion about this UK Environment Act. I think what we would like to see is firm commitment as part of the withdrawal bill. A, that the existing functions and you know the bodies will preserve those duties, but also commitments for the future, but robust commitments. Patrick? Uh, just very briefly, picking up on, on one aspect uh, of that, which, as, as you say, would not be included in the EU withdrawal bill, but is an issue which arises uh, as a result of it. Uh, you talked about the, the potential for a, a specialist environmental court in Scotland. Um, my view is that there's been a case for that for, for quite some time, even aside from the, the, the European Union context that we're in now. Uh, but the, the Scottish Government hasn't so far been persuaded of that. Uh, would it be fair to say, and I wonder if anyone would disagree, uh, that even if the Scottish Government isn't yet persuaded of the, the case for that, it would be premature to rule it out until they know the reality of what are the environmental functions uh, which are going to be the responsibility uh, of, uh, of Scotland in a devolved context uh, and, and what pressure that places on, on uh, Scotland in terms of, of decision making. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone in this committee that Scottish Environment Link members have supported the creation of environmental courts in Scotland, uh, exactly because we have been um, failing to fully implement a lot of the Aarhus Convention's um, requirements, and we feel that environmental courts or tribunals would be a way of addressing that. Uh, we did feel that in the context of the UK's exit from the EU, there was even a, a more important or, you know, even more a stronger case for environmental courts um, to address issues of access access to justice. Um, we were, of course, disappointed at the decision of the Scottish Government, but I would like to read their decision in a slightly more optimistic vein, and perhaps um, I hope that in the future, given that we have identified this governance gap, um, they will sort of reopen the door to examining environmental courts or tribunals, um, because it is an important part of the solution. A discussion of a mood of optimism. <laughs> I could do with some. I, I, I want to move on, Robin, to repatriation areas. Otherwise, I'll not manage to cover all the, the themes that we've got. Uh, and Claire Skipper from the NFU said she, you, you were happy to contribute to, to the beginning of the discussion. Claire, over to you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. Claire Skipper from NFU Scotland. Um, <coughs> repatriation of powers. I mean, first of all, um, we come from the starting point that NFU Scotland is obviously very much alive to the political and constitutional tensions that are existing um, in, in this debate. Our position is not necessarily framed from an expert um, constitutional legal perspective. Um, rather, we come from the end of the telescope while we're speaking on behalf of our members and what they feel they need um, to kind of you know, survive and, and prosper after Brexit. Um, but what is important to establish, obviously, as a starting principle, is that agriculture has been in the domain of the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government, since 1999. Generally, that's worked very well for our members. Um, they wish to see no rollback on that. Um, essentially, it's allowed decisions that impact their businesses to be made closer to the businesses that they implement. So um, it's important to establish that as a starting point. Um, so from discussion with NFU Scotland members, they're their starting point, their, their primary concern isn't exactly where the powers will sit after we leave the EU. It's more about ensuring who can get the best deal for them to allow their business, businesses to prosper. And what, what a good deal for them will be um, is frictionless and barrier-free trade with the EU. Um, secondly, access to a skilled and, and competent workforce for seasonal and permanent posts to work on farm and off farm, very important. And thirdly, this is where the key arguments over um, repatriation of powers come in. They want um, a new agricultural policy in Scotland that allows us to effectively target um, policy and money um, towards action rather than inertia um, and to allow the, their businesses to grow. So um, that's just a bit of context setting. In terms of the repatriation of powers, um, I think the point was raised earlier that clearly the constitutional backdrop of the UK has changed a lot since we joined the EU in the 1970s. So for us, we can see no clear-cut way of defining where specific directives and EU policies can be cut and pasted into Scots or UK law after we leave. 
Um, but what we do know is that obviously the day that we leave the EU will also be leaving the Common Agricultural Policy, the CAP. Um, since 1999, Scottish Government has had um, powers to implement the CAP. Um, and when we leave the EU, it'll be up to UK Government and the devolved legislatures to decide and devise how we can support agriculture in the longer term. Um, whilst those powers have just been over implementation, there is a widely held view, and I believe that this was supported by the um, Scottish Constitutional Convention in 1995, that due to issues such as agriculture not being specifically reserved within Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act, Scottish Government should retain the ability to frame policy in these areas such as agriculture. Um, however, it does appear that the EU withdrawal bill turns that on its head slightly and assumes that those powers aren't absolute across the subject matter, so that's where we're running into some difficulty. Um, but what we believe is likely to happen, um, and what we hope does happen, is that Scottish Government retains the ability to manage payment schemes um, if indeed we do go down the road of, of having a future payment scheme to support agriculture and implement agreed schemes, um, policies and regulations in a manner very similar to what we've done um, for the last 20 odd years under the CAP. Um, we need these management and implementation powers to be used in a way that um, will be subject to certain constraints, which will probably be set at a UK level. Um, in terms of what these constraints are, these will be the overarching areas of policy that cut across borders um, and make sense to, done, to do on a, on a framework basis in a manner very similar to the way that it's been done under the EU. So the areas of regulation such as that maintain the UK single market, things like animal welfare issues, um, pesticides regulation, chemicals regulation and, and things like that, where it'll make no sense to have four differing and separate schemes of regulation. But um, what we do see is vitally important is that anything that is managed on a framework basis such as this, um, and, and then those issues that are left within the mainstay of the devolved nations are commonly agreed. And I put emphasis on that. We have been very clear from the outset that any move to drop down a policy framework from, from you know, that's a deferic centric view of the world onto Scotland will not be acceptable. Um, there's got to be consensus. And that approach wouldn't work for Scotland. It wouldn't work for Wales nor Northern Ireland or indeed England. Um, so why is there emphasis on, being, on it being commonly agreed? Um, because for us, it's vital that there's flexibility for the devolved nations to use more or less of different policy tools um, in manners that fit the differing agricultural systems across the UK. Uh, here in Scotland, 85% of our land is defined as less favoured area. Um, in England, the opposite is true. 15% um, of, of, of England is defined less favoured area. So it's vital that we retain <laughs> powers to support our less favoured areas and also use elements of, of coupled support. Um, things like protected geographical indications like the Scotch beef label are also extremely important for us here in Scotland. Um, and likewise, for other parts of the UK, there'll be other issues which are more important to them and less important to us. Um, but how do we ensure it's commonly agreed? And, and this is really the sticking point for us that's really important. Um, the arguments that seem to be ongoing over the repatriation of powers suggest to us that UK and devolved ministers need to get a lot better at collective decision making. Um, and we, we need to try and find some resolution to that pretty urgently, I would suggest. Um, I'm not sure how it could be done, perhaps through a beefed up joint ministerial committee or an emulated council of ministers um, like is currently done in the EU or better dispute um, resolution mechanism, but something of that sort needs to be devised quickly. Um, the issue isn't just about policy making powers, there's issues over funding as well, which perhaps we might touch on in, in discussion. Um, so to sum up, basically, for us, the issue, the issue isn't really as clean cut as saying ish, um, that the powers will be lifted and cut and paste either into UK or Scottish um, decision making powers. Um, for us, the emphasis is on collective decision making um, and ensuring that Scotland has the powers that, that it needs to devise a policy that's suited to Scotland in a, in a manner that still allows us to maintain the integrity of the UK single market, because that is very important for, for trade as well. So I'll leave it there for now. Yeah. Okay. That's very help, help with the in, in, introduction, Claire. Repatriation of powers bit we're in just now, and I'm, what I'm trying to, keen to try to tell you, so Colin, and that Colin reads from the University of Dundee in the next section, gets to talk about common frameworks, and I realise there's there's a close similarity between the similarity is not the right word. A lot of synergy between the two issues. Mm -hmm. But if we could keep it at the moment, how the bill's structured in terms of repatriation of powers for this bit of discussion, we can get into framework stuff later. Murdo, do you want to 
Yes, I'm thanks. To... I mean, I thought Claire, that, that that was very helpful in terms of illustrating, you know, on a, on a very practical sense, some of the issues. Two, two, two brief questions, if I can. Um, you, you give some examples of things you thought that, or NFUS thought, should be uh, decided at a UK level as opposed to um, devolved level. Does NFUS have a, a finely detailed proposal now as it was exactly uh, exactly which level every single piece of legislation should sit? First question. And the second question, and you, and you, you sort of touched on this in, in what you said, but ultimately, you know, how, how do we arrive at a settled view on how where these things sit? I mean, how should this actually, what's the mechanism for actually getting to a point where we can agree this? Um, well, to, to, yeah, to take the first question first, um, we are in the process of putting together a very detailed policy proposal. Um, we're going out in the road starting next week to consult with our members about what, you know, what the die in the ditch issues are over policy and, and, what, and what they feel we need to, to build into a new agricultural policy after Brexit. Um, the examples I, I gave I don't think will change. I think it makes sense and we have consensus with our um, colleagues elsewhere in the UK in, in terms of the farming unions that it, it makes sense to maintain very high standards on issues such as animal welfare and public health as well, I don't think I mentioned. Um, and indeed, this slightly goes back to the previous area discussion, these areas are very likely to be fairly equivalent to what we do under the EU anyway, because we have very high standards in these areas. We have no desire to roll them back. Um, so it, it just, you know, purely from um, a kind of technical or um, logistical point of view, it makes no sense for us, you know, to split off into four and devise four different ways of doing it and then try and find commonality. Instead, we want there to be joint decision making over how we um, sort of emulate that into UK law. Um, feels like the easiest way to do it. Um, in terms of your second question about how, how we get to that point of joint decision making, um, it's I'm not I'm not a constitutional expert, and I don't believe that there is anything kind of written into law at the moment that would allow that mechanism to take place. And clearly, we have the joint ministerial committee structure at at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm not you know if, if you if you read and believe the press reports, it doesn't seem as though we've been getting, you know, very good outcomes from that or, you know, a lot of progress coming out of those discussions that have taken place, but perhaps there's been a bit of break in the deadlock over the past couple of weeks. Um, it, it, it may well be, uh, for us, it was a shame that it wasn't on the face of the withdrawal bill about how things like frameworks would be dealt with um, upon leaving the EU, because issues such as the CAP are so massive um, and, and so vast. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's 40% of the EU spend every year is on the CAP, you, you would have thought that, that an issue like that would have been referenced on the face of the bill and, and it hasn't been, so that's just detail that we need to work through. Let's widen this out then. Kate. Thank you. Um, Kate Horton from the Royal Town Planning Institute in Scotland. Um, just to start um, off as well, just for context, I should say that um, the RTPI doesn't um, take a position on um, where uh, devolved powers should sit and um, we're entirely neutral on that um, and our priority is working with our members who work as town planners um, throughout the United Kingdom in the public, private and third sectors to make sure that that system works the best way it possibly can. Um, however, I think it was worth jumping in here just because um, I think the planning system provides a really neat example which I'm sure is replicated elsewhere in, in policy um, of why we need to make sure there is more clarity in this bill about um, where devolved powers and repatriated powers are going to end up. Now, the planning system itself is entirely domestic law, um, and it predates the United Kingdom's uh, membership of what is now the EU, um, and that continues to be the case. It's an entirely devolved issue as well, um, and within the competency of the Scottish Parliament and government. Um, the town and country planning system, however, um, obviously exists in a context, um, and it is linked into to other areas of process and legislation. Um, and I, a kind of useful one to highlight here is environmental impact assessment, environmental regulations. Um, now, what has evolved since those regulations, since that impact assessment has been introduced, um, is that you essentially have a twin track system where um, environmental impact assessment happens as part of the planning process, um, but is obviously governed by European, by the European directive, transposed into domestic law. Um, what has happened in terms of domestic law, sorry, go back to domestic law in terms of planning in the last 20 years especially, is that 
in Scotland, the system has really started to diverge from the English system. And it gives us a really nice example of how constitutionally um, the nations have changed um, over the past decades. So you now have in Scotland quite, um, still founded in the same principles, but quite a different planning process to what you have in England, for example. Um, and I think what is really worth highlighting here is that when um, those powers are repatriated regarding environmental impact assessment, that is perhaps an opportunity, but something to be cautious with thinking about how we decide how that process will be integrated with the planning process. It will still have to happen, um, and I certainly hope it still will. Um, but while we, I don't want to get into frameworks because I know we're going to address that next, while we support a common framework across the UK, it will be important to think about how the planning process actually works and how a new environmental impact assessment process will interact with that. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask, folks, as we're going around the table, just to be clear where they are on this Clause 11 issue that everyone is focusing on as well in terms of the... From a lot of the evidence covered it. A lot of the evidence said that they thought that the bill went too far because that's really the, the, the you know the nub of this discussion at the end of the day, and we'll get into the framework. So I don't know if you if whether what you've just said, Kate, if you want to reflect on clause 11 and whether you think it's satisfactory, should be amended, should be dropped, whatever. I think what I'd say is that looking at um, the outcomes we want to get to in terms of making sure that process is working effectively. Um, we need to think a little bit more carefully, and I think there needs to be a little bit more clarity um, about whether um, the issues being discussed are technical or non-technical. Simon, do you want to address that when you make your point as well? Yes. Um, yeah, we. Um, it's really starting really from where, from where Murdo started with, actually, on this question of you know, dividing devolved and non-devolved powers. Um, we'd start with the same position, actually, that, that, that helpfully David Mundell said yesterday. It's a presumption of devolution. We'd buy into that. We're looking for an outcome. And as far as Clause 11 is concerned, it's, it's not so much, it's, what we need to do is to get to, as far as the fishing industry is concerned, in terms of day-to-day -day management, we need, devolved, we need devolved powers back to Scotland. That's absolutely clear. That's the, way we, the only way we can see to have proper, proper reactive management, as we'd call it. Now, whether that means, as we suggest in our submission, the obvious way to do that, even if we accept that Clause 11 is required to be like that just for time reasons or legal reasons or any other reasons you want or share the massive work that has to be done, even if we accept that that has to happen on day one of Brexit, we see a reason why on day two or week two or whatever it is that Scotland couldn't resume the abilities to exercise that presumption of devolution as soon as possible afterwards. If someone can devise a way, a constitutional lawyer much better than us, to achieve that same aim without having to amend the bill so much the better but we really focus on the outcome and the outcome is devolved management in Scottish waters. It will require and if statutes made statutes made and there is no, uh, no no one at this stage has any certainty if that statute was to pass about when these powers would come to the Scottish Parliament. Yes that, that, and that is a problem for us we, we would like that to know whether it's in the statute as you suggest chair or if there's some other way it's the outcome we're focused on. Right. I'm going to ask others around the table to comment on that as well. Robin, I'll come back to you, Claire. <clears throat> I'm afraid you're not going to draw me into taking a side one way or the other on uh, the, the close, but um, what... I'm just trying to get something from a report um, that we can write. Uh, uh, so, I'm going to, well, I'll do, I'll do two things and say um, the WS starting point, and this predates the withdrawal bill, was, and I, I don't see how to say this without getting into common framework stuff, but um, we, we wanted to see common frameworks because there's environmental issues, there's pollution issues, there's animals that cross borders, they don't reflect those borders and so on. But um, our starting point, our position was that we wanted to see that done uh, with respect to the devolution uh, agreement as it stands, because that's always been the way that we've approached uh, constitutional issues, is just to say, you know, we'll... This is, this is up to that, but the starting point is this is what the devolution arrangement is as it currently stands, sort of thing. Um, the other thing I was going to offer was an example of where, um, in a way, we've built a, a common framework across the UK um, in an area, so in the marine protection area, which is a, is a, is a mixture between devolved things, reserved things, and so on. There's, there's devolved and reserve happening within that marine protection area. And what happened was the different administrations of the UK worked together to create a, a shared UK Marine Act. It set some kind of shared common goals, a really important one around um, trying to achieve good environmental status for the waters around the UK, 
but then there was the uh, freedom, if that's the right word, with, for each of the, um, well, the flexibility really is the right word, for each of the different um, devolved administrations. So it, the example here, the Scottish Government could develop that Marine Act, could develop its own marine planning framework, all, the, all those sort, sort of things. Marie? I just wanted to um, ask a little extra question to Simon about the uh, Fisheries Fede Fishing Federation position. So you're very clear that um, fisheries management um, needs to be devolved and devolved very quickly to, to the Scottish Parliament. A little less clear about um, quota negotiation and, as you say, acting as a coastal state. So you said you, know, you understand why that might need to be a UK... Um, power but then you go on to say that it would be you think that where the fishing is mostly caught you know where the fish are mostly caught in Scottish waters it should be Scottish ministers who lead on that do you want to tell us a little bit more about that please if I may yes thanks Marie yes um, what we're looking at in, in whether it's day-to-day -day management or negotiating as a coastal state is we're looking for the thing that makes most sense to our members that has the biggest likelihood to, to get what they what they need and for them, the UK as the coastal state has the negotiating power, which will give a win-win for Scotland. That's how they see it. The catch is, of course, if you like, we have to make sure that Scottish interests, as a predominant fishing nation, if you like, within the UK, that those priorities that we have as Scotland for our fisheries, the stocks where we have a dominant interest, that that is translated into the UK's position. Similarly, though, it's not just a one-way street. We would expect the English, the Welsh, the Northern Irish fisheries, where they have a particular interest, there are species in the Channel we're not interested in, for example, where they would have the right, as it were, to have the predominant say in the U framing the UK's position as a coastal state on those things. We don't see it as necessarily, or it shouldn't be antagonistic, it, it, because there's enough separation, I think, and there's enough of a bias towards Scotland and most of the important stocks to make that self-evident. I don't think it needs to be in legislation. I think there should be scope for sensible adults in a room together to say this is a mem if you like a mem memorandum of understanding that could be a, one way of doing it that the Scottish interest in framing the UK's position is understood and the UK takes that forward for our members that's the best guarantee they think using the whole might of you if you like of the UK's waters to get the best result for them and that's how they see it. Servant if we can stick to the at this stage to the repatriation of powers issue. I'm, I'm keen that I try to protect Colin's space here a bit with our own common frameworks because we're already straight into it a fair bit and I've probably totally failed already, but we'll keep going. Seraphine. Uh, yeah, um, Seraphine Pather from Kosla. Um, very briefly on, on the issue of repatriation and apportionment rather than just the, the common frameworks. I mean, f clearly we agree there should be UK-wide policies and bodies and enforcement in issues that have transboundary nature, the same way that they are EU, EU law on things that are, have, a, by, by definition, transboundary. Um, the problem is how to do the apportionment of responsibility between the Scottish level and the UK level when these, all these powers are coming back, because that naturally ch completely changes the dynamics of the evolution uh, in the UK. Uh, and it is interesting that the, the, the bill itself is very, very open, it gives us options. Uh, and it's actually, if you want to try to make a sense of the bill, it's better, much better to actually refer to the explanatory memoranda as well as the February and March white paper, and in particular the 16th of October Joint Ministerial Committee communique on issues, because there they send a number of principles how this relation could move forward and when that uh, discussion should take forward. Problem is that it's all very generally implicit, and that's much less of uh, a, a clear and, and stable relation that what you see now in the EU treaties. In the EU treaties, you've got something called the principle of subsidiarity that says the principle how a resp shared responsibility should be uh, apportioned between different levels of government. You have the principle of proportionality, which, of course, is not foreign to you, 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 UK uh, anyway, but that is much, very, very, very clearly framed, and, and the EU has to operate on that. If you look at, for instance, the 16th of October communique, you really see that those two principles I implicit. but considering that we have very different approaches, increasingly different diverging approaches in the UK, that perhaps might not be enough and would be much comforting that those principles were framed in a very precise legal terms in the bill itself. To give a level playing field and a kind of a sense of reassurance to everybody uh, in the place. I'm going to veer into a small international example of pressing actuality, which is the Catalan crisis. No, 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 it's very simple. I mean, 
that issue has many dimensions, but one dimension that's perhaps not understood here is that a lot of the problem is that the different level of government, they all share all the powers between the central and the uh, regional government, and because they, they don't manage to actually agree most of the time, they end up going to, apart from political discussions, we see a bonfire of the equivalent of UK Supreme Court positive conflicts of competences. And you know, at the moment, the UK Supreme Court has almost nothing, no, no hair the cases in terms of devolution, uh, in terms of this distribution of competences. Uh, it's a risk that unless there's clear guarantees in the bill, we might end up in that situation where we hear a lot of litigation going to UK Supreme Court. Thank you. Clear. Thank you. And then, then I'm going to move on to three more. Thank you. Uh, just a, a really quick point just on your question regarding Clause 11. Um, this isn't the view of NFU Scotland. It's just something that occurred to me reading um, reading through it. But essentially, Clause 11, it, it means that Scottish Parliament will be able to modify or confirm power by subordinate, or relation, uh, subordinate legislation to modify retained EU law. Uh, and this is what's been characterised as the land grab. An alternative view that occurred to me was that this simply would stop the devolved administrations from legislating incompatibly with the EU on areas such as agricultural frameworks, for example, which would be retaining the status quo if we were to stay within the EU anyway. Um, so that, as I say, that's not the view of NFUS, it's just something that occurred to me. Um, something that is within the explanatory notes of the bill, I understand, is that there seems to be um, kind of warm words, I suppose, from UK government that they'll work closely with devolved administrations uh, in areas such as repatriation of powers released by orders in council procedure, which is, again, not something that I am familiar with. Um, but I, what I think we perhaps could do a little bit more examination into is, is why that then can't be put onto the face of the bill, um, perhaps by, um, there was talk of a sunset clause earlier, um, so, you know, a similar procedure, a, a date by which these issues need to be worked through in order just to give clarity, because that's what industry needs. So. OK. Right, we'll move on to framework issues. Now, Colin, if you don't mind, Colin Reid from the University of Dundee. Thank you. As we've, as discussion has shown already, whatever decision is taken on repatriation, wherever the boundaries are drawn between devolved, reserved, retained EU matters, there's going to have to be collaboration, and that collaboration is going to extend upwards to the international level, below the national to the local government mechanism. The current devolved arrangements are have got lots of examples of bilateral cooperation between the devolved administrations and London. They're not very strong at all on arrangements for bringing all four of the administrations together. When you look at the communique from the Joint Ministerial Council a couple of weeks ago, it identifies a number of ways in which things could be done together in, in the future. It talks about common goals, minimum or maximum standards, harmonisation, limits on action, mutual recognition. It has to be recognised that each of these may actually require a different structure, may require a different form of organisation. And the way, the extent to which you change things to achieve this can vary greatly. One option would be to a complete rewriting of the constitution onto a federal model, where you have an English parliament, an English government that deals with things separately. It may simply require a different way of working in Westminster, uh, recognising that it has to pass two sorts of legislation, one sort of higher level legislation that is like an EU directive that deals with the UK as a whole, and then separately more detailed legislation for responsibilities in, in England. You then have to think about, well, if we're going to have common frameworks, who's going to dis a number of questions arise. First of all, who is it that's going to develop the policy, the standards, the goals, the framework? And there are a range of options. It could be joint working between governments, but that will require genuine willingness to cooperate, which the last few years suggests is not always going to be the case. It could be one body has the power but does it by consultation with other bodies. You could give power to specialist groups like the Joint Nature Conservation Committee who would do a lot of the discussion, a lot of the hard work in doing things together, but then pass on recommendations to the legally authorised legislators and so on. Or maybe we need to create new bodies to fulfil functions. We have some bodies that stand above on specialist areas or more generally that link together the different the, the devolved and UK administrations. But whatever happens in relation to forming the, the policy, you then got to think who actually has the power to legislate. Somebody has to have the power to legislate. Is that going to be strictly divided between the different administrations or is it going to be a wide area of shared competence? At present, 
when you're acting under the European Communities Act, either London or Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, can legislate, are we going to be happy to have large areas of shared competence? And if so, who's going to decide what's done under, what's done where, what are the control mechanisms going to be on that? If we're going to have UK-wide frameworks, how is compliance with them going to be enforced? At present, if a member state doesn't meet the requirements of EU law, the Commission can take action, individuals can take action. What would happen if there's an agreed framework at the UK level, but the Welsh, Northern Ireland, Scottish, English government doesn't actually do it, implement it properly, implement it fully? What are the consequences of that going to be? Who's going to scrutinise what happens at any of the general policy-making level? If we're going to have new bodies that are devising the general framework, what's their accountability going to be to whom? Are the parliaments going to work separately? Should the parliaments be thinking about new ways of coming together, joint commissions of the different parliaments to fulfil all these functions? An awful lot of questions, I'm sorry, not many answers. The answers are complicated by further things such as cost, who's going to be paying for whatever structures are put in, capacity and expertise, how often do we need to have separate bodies dealing with things, and complicated by the asymmetrical nature of British devolution. In the EU, it's easy. You've got EU and the member states, and all the member states are in the same position within the UK on all sorts of, from the, what from the outside often seem like fairly esoteric issues, but I'm sure as soon as you start dealing with them are actually very major ones. There are differences between the precise powers of the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Ireland administrations. So, sorry, lots of questions rather than answers. Questions are being asked by lots and lots of people, and you've explained it pretty well, I think. Um, we could get into trying to design a system here today. That's not going to get us very far, I don't think. Um, well, whether it's some sort of council of ministers in the future or whatever it might be. So I, I guess the, the best thing we can probably do in this bit of the discussion is try to agree what the principles would be that, that we need to establish uh, to, to create whatever these frameworks might look like, whether it's a... There was 114 areas outlined of potential areas where they need to, to, to agree. That I, think, well, I think it's now becoming clear that there's going to be a hierarchical approach to that. There'll be some sort of frameworks which will be required at a national level. Some will require a member understand, understanding. Some of them may only require an exchange of letters. Lots of mechanisms we can use to, to deal with these. But I guess the key question for me, and I hope we can address today, is on what basis should they be taken forward, though? Is that by consultation or is it by agreement? I think that's the, you know, the, the, I'm sure there'll be others who want to add other thoughts into the process, but that's where my head is at the moment. Claire, I see you nodding. Um, I, no, I, I agree with, with what's been said. They're obviously clearly very complex questions and, and I raised some of them in, in my remarks, but I think um, it's not consultation or agreement. I think it's both. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm afraid I, I, I don't have the answer by which structure you would ensure that, but I think I think that there needs to be um, a bit more goodwill on both sides, perhaps, uh, to try and, and and escape some of the politics around it and actually l look at where we want to be and then what things need to be dealt with um, in the hierarchy to get there. Um, if we're to be leaving the EU um, on you know 29th of March 2019, then th that is a, a pretty solid timeline by which. I would hope that we would have a bit more clarity in some of these areas, but for now it seems like we are at a bit of a stalemate. I don't. Um, thanks, Camina. Um, I, I think there's a, a view, and I think this is um, reflected in what um, Colin just, just said, which I found very helpful, thank you. Um, I think there is a view um, emerging, but before we kind of just accept that it's emerging, I would just like to test it. There's a view emerging that um, uh, the solution to the disagreement between the two governments about Clause 11 is a solution that relies on common frameworks. So we know what the position of the UK government is, because the position of the UK government is reflected in the bill. We know what the position of the Scottish government is, because the position of the Scottish government is reflected in their legislative consent memorandum and in the proposed amendments that they've put forward. Um, and it seems, if I've, mis if I've misunderstood you, Colin, please say so, but if it seems that, that, that you, you think, and, and indeed a lot of people think that the solution to this uh, disagreement between the governments about about Clause 11 lies it lies in common frameworks, so that there will um, uh, n need to be uh, um, uh, some recognition in the withdrawal bill um, that some of these common frameworks, 
Some of them might just be exchanges of letters. But some of these common frameworks might require um, to be enshrined or at least recognised uh, in, in legislation in a manner that constrains the legislative competence or the devolved competence um, of um, uh, administrations. Is, is, that, is, that, is that broadly your, your view? Yes, I, th I think so. The, the differences between the two governments represent fundamentally, fundamentally different starting points, and they're not going to abandon those quickly. If you look at the, the bill as essentially a transitional measure, a way of getting things done quickly, the question is, well, where are we going to be in however many years' time? And if the, my, my suspicion, without being deeply involved, is that if the devolved administrations had greater confidence that their position, their freedom, their powers were, going, were definitely going to be recognised in the future, then the fact that the, we, the way towards that involves giving more power to London may not be as big a, may not be as big a problem. Would it be your view then that Clause 11, as it currently stands, would would work if it were subject to a sunset clause? I think that if not just a sunset clause, but there was a, there was greater agreement and confidence and will on where it was going. I think a sunset clauses by themselves are potentially dangerous because you can you just hit a a problem on this. When you, when you ride towards the sunset and right. haven't got everything done, but the, you, but, hit, you hit a problem. But we're trying to deal with legislation, as you know. Yeah. So how do you write that trust yeah. or that I hope think that's, I into, think, into legislation? I think that's the, the fundamental problem. And on all these structural issues, any structure can work if there's goodwill, however ill-designed it is. Any structure, however beautifully designed, won't work if there's no goodwill to make it work. Okay, just ask, 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 are there any of our guests here who think that this idea that you can solve this problem through common frameworks isn't going to work. Is there any, is there any dissent from that, from that kind of view? That, no, there isn't. Okay, well, thank you. I, I, well, <laughs> whether there is, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the case, but we'll, we'll test it. If you want to reflect on that, what you were going to say anyway, Robin, then please feel free. And I know Kate wanted in as well. I'm not sure if I, I quite understand the question. Uh, well, from <laughs> Mr. Tompkins, but maybe you'll get an answer in, in what I say, hopefully. Uh, so. <laughs> I think so. our starting point predates the withdrawal bill was that um, common frameworks are a desirable outcome because there are issues that spread across uh, our borders that, that you know, fish don't know which exclusive economic zone they're in, which territorial waters they're in, that sort of thing. Um, but we were also quite clear that, and this was partly about um, a starting point of, not a, of wanting to respect the existing devolution se settlement, was that they needed to be commonly agreed. But the, the other benefit of those um, common frameworks being commonly agreed by the different administrations um, within within the UK is that I think when you kind of have that that buy-in and that involvement in creating those um, in, in creating those common frameworks, you're going to have a, gr a, a greater desire to make them work and a greater desire to uh, effectively implement them. And they're going to be things that that also um, give you better flexibility to reflect whether it's different geography or whether it's different um, politics, different desires within each administration. So another thing that we're really keen on when it comes to the common frameworks we want to end up with, for example, is that they, they do, by their nature, allow an element of flexibility. For example, we're quite keen that they end up being things that are uh, uh, floors rather than, than ceilings, so that if there's a uh, one of the nations of, of the UK wants to go further and create higher environmental standards, there's that ability for, to make that decision to go further and to go higher and so on. But I think, yeah, the, the key thing is we, we want to see common frameworks be arrived at at the end point. We want to see them be commonly agreed where they, they spread in, into devolved matters. And, yeah, there's, I think, you know, one of the questions that, that Professor, Professor Reid asked, is, is, or what I took from it, is there's different ways that you can reach that conclusion. There's different paths to that conclusion. Kate? Yeah, um you asked, Chair, if you thought um, frameworks needed to happen through consultation or by agreement. Um, and it was just to, I think, agree with Claire on the point that I think it's actually both. Um, I think that you, just to, to go back to the kind of devolved issues again in relation to this, um, economic development and spatial development policy are devolved issues, and therefore there are different policies on both sides of the border. And I think, therefore, you, you're going to have to have um, a two-way conversation about how you meet in the middle of those policies in order to create your common framework. Um, and I think just as to give an example as well, I know you're looking for them, I think these issues 
often obviously become crystallised at the physical border. Um, and obviously the Scottish-English border, um, there are travel to work areas that cross it, there are function economic areas that cross it, and um, those activities aren't restricted by the existence of that border. Um, and I know that the local authorities along that border therefore work together very closely in practical terms. Um, and I think that's just an example of actually how a common framework um, would behave in terms of guiding the actions and the decisions of those local authorities. And um, Seraphine, I'm sure, would probably be able to add more detail on that point. Well, I'll, I'll get to Seraphine, but Patrick wanted to say something as well. Um, know that thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Just, a, just a very brief um, point about how the, about the language we're using to describe these things. I think Adam asked a very uh, important and, and clear question, with, with one exception, that the, the term common frameworks can mean different things. If we talk about commonly agreed frameworks, yes, there might be times when that's achieved by the exchange of, of letters between two governments, or more than two, um, and there might be times when it's done by legislation, where it requires legislation. But that in itself has, has two possibilities. One is that each parliament or legislative body in its own jurisdiction passes its own legislation to achieve that commonality. And the other is um, that the UK government imposes legislation regardless of, of the, the decision-making authority of, uh, of, of another body. So common, uh, I think, you know, to me it means agreed in common, but perhaps we need to be more explicit about that and talk about commonly agreed frameworks or imposed UK frameworks, because they're profoundly different in terms of the, uh, the questions about authority and, 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 and democratic accountability. Colin and then Daphne. Can I, very quickly, in relation to what's just been said, there's, of course, a third option, which is commonly agreed, and it's agreed that it will be legislated from by at London using any uh, reserve powers, which... But surely that, that itself blows a hole through the argument about devolved democratic accountability, because that, if, yeah, exactly. if, if, it, it raises if a that common question, framework is, is separately legislated in an agreed way, then if at some future time that agreement no longer exists, uh, it's down to each participant in that agreement to decide whether they want to put up with it or change. But if it's legislated at UK level, uh, then that authority to change the agreement in future uh, has also been ceded. That's a question of whether it's ceded forever or just ceded for the particular, for, for, as a one-off yeah. convenient function. Yeah. Colin, can I just, on that specific point before I come to, to, to Daphne, sorry Daphne, does that two-way conversation that we're talking about here that consultation or agreement, whatever it might be, does that need to be written into the bill at Clause 7, I think it would be, do you think, in your view? It would certainly strengthen the arguments for cooperation to have something more firmly in there. I mean, I, it's odd that prior to all this debate coming up, we had the situation where the UK, UK Parliament was able, and UK government, able to legislate on European community matters for Scotland as well. And whereas we've got the Sewell Convention in relation to primary legislation, to the best of my knowledge, there was no formal process for the Scottish Parliament getting involved when it was agreed that delegated legislation to implement EU measures in Scotland were actually going to be made on a GB or a UK basis in London rather than in Scotland. And I find it a bit strange that it's the, it, it, it's right that there should be a big concern, but there's been a gap that's been there for since the beginning of the arrangements with the, the wide powers for the UK government to, to make law in EC matters. Okay, Daphne. Yeah, just to really agree with Colin on his remarks regarding frameworks, I think there's a, a few points from a Scottish environment link point of view. Um, what we would like to see is the right process put in place for agreeing on what UK frameworks are, how they're agreed. At the moment, there is a marked lack of debate on those issues. Um, and I think it's indicative that in the joint communique that was issued last week, that I think um, Seraphine mentioned earlier, um, there was a lot of um, you know good principles in terms of where UK frameworks can, can apply, but nothing about stakeholder engagement, transparent and inclusive process. Um, so obviously, uh, if we want to have a real dialogue about how, how this can work effectively, uh, we need to include as many stakeholders as we can um, and need to take those views into account.
account. So that's one important point. Um, the second point is that we've been talking almost exclusively about UK frameworks. Um, I think this doesn't necessarily acknowledge the fact that um, the, the specific problems that Northern Ireland will, ha will have in terms of its borders with the Republic of Ireland, from an environmental point of view, they're considered a distinct ecological unit. So you could imagine some of these UK frameworks actually being wider frameworks that involve the Republic uh, of Ireland in some ways. That's perhaps a, a slightly separate topic. Um, but then you also mentioned uh, Clause 7, uh, Kamina, and I think that's perhaps where we have had some specific concerns uh, with respect to, in fact, Clauses 7, 8 and 9, uh, which reference you know, deficiencies in EU law and how it would operate in post-Brexit uh, and a post-Brexit environment and technical changes. I think it's very important to limit those delegated powers to ensure that they actually do what they're intended to do. At the moment, they are framed in a very sort of general and open-ended way, which means we might have substantive changes which we don't necessarily want and are not within the line the of the technical bill. stuff in the next bit of discussion. So I'm just flagging it. Yeah, right. so that gives me a good link, link in, though, <laughs> to Seraphin, because that's that's where we're going next. And Seraphin, when, as you introduce this next bit around the withdrawal bill and the technicality issue, um, could you maybe give us what you... I, I don't know if you saw the general principles that flew, flew that came out of the GMC last week that was already been flagged up by Daphne. If you'd like to reflect on what you think of these at that, as you make your contribution now, that would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just going to um, come back, just for, for the flow of conversation, coming, the colleague has just mentioned, I mean, in terms of uh, enforcement models and, and, and new common frameworks. I mean, if you see the, the, our submission, we, as a result of the exchange we have with our counterparts in other countries, we have identified a number of common frameworks that could be learn or serve as inspiration for uh, the UK and the developed administrations from Italy, from Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Sweden, Finland. I mean, even the community of the regions can, funnily enough, be a, a, good, a good practice here. Uh, this is a um, rather important issue because we are basically, the Great Repeal Bill effectively is changing the constitution of the UK because of the powers being repatriated. So it's something rather not technical and serious and beyond political. There are, uh, there should be, in our view, in the repeal bill, a number, there should be already a, a number of explicit provisions on how uh, common frameworks will be developed and perhaps reflection on, on, on possible uh, mo models. Uh, that would not just include the developed administration, but also, for, for, for if I'm rich on that, local government as well as one of the three tiers of government of the UK. Uh, at the moment, that's not been certainly part of the discussion, in addition other than a number of bilateral discussions we might have had with the different governments and with the European Commission. We met Mr. Bernier last uh, Monday. But for instance, give you an example of a possible framework. In, uh, we, in 2001, sorry, 2011, the UK government, the UK Parliament approved the Localism Act. The Localism Act uh, sets uh, a number of provisions where if a local authority is um, uh, going to be liable to pay EU fines for environmental infringements, for instance, who, how the apportionment of responsibility will be made. The, originally, it was, it was a bit like the repeal, uh, the withdrawal bill. The UK minister wanted to take the decision on his own, and what we managed to negotiate is a system called the European Policy Statement 2012 of the Localism Act 2011, where there is a more iterative way of resolving these disputes. In the end, is the UK government will have the last word, but allows local government to actually try to understand and agree with the government where the responsibility lies. We see that sort of principles, which are already being agreed in, 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 this, in this piece of UK legislation, could be actually be a good base for the wider governance issue of the UK. Um, something that will include as well, I believe, the Scottish Parliament. We haven't talked yet about the Scottish Parliament. Given the changes that the evolution has had operating the UK as a whole, and the changes that are going to come because of um, a, the, repeal, the withdrawal bill, it should be perhaps a consideration whether, for instance, UK, uh, sorry, Scottish uh, members of the Scottish Parliament, Assembly members, uh, participate in joint policy making in London. We have made a number of recommendations or just suggestions perhaps expanding the House of Lords, creating a special chamber. I mean, there's a number of mechanisms. At the moment, the only mechanisms we are aware of for interparliamentary cooperation is on EU law, but precisely the, the early warning system where 
uh, the different European committees of the four parliaments agree some, in an in in informal consultation mechanism called the UK Forum. Well, clearly that's something that is not uh, sufficient for the, given the amount of change is going to come. But if I draw from, again, in terms of the role of the Scottish Parliament on the issue of uh, a, how, how they could scrutinise better uh, the, role, uh, the, 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 repeal, the withdrawal bill and, and subsequent acts, I, I like to draw the example of the European uh, EU law as well. Uh, the scrutiny provisions, parliamentary scrutiny provisions of the delegated and implementing acts. These are secondary pieces of legislation of EU law in which the European Parliament, the MEPs, have effectively a veto. So suspensive vetoes, they can actually, uh, they have like a month to respond to whatever the Commission has done as, a, as, a, as, a, as an implementing act. But if they refuse, that piece of law is not uh, included. We will, uh, it will not be bad to consider the role of the Scottish Parliament and the other devolved assemblies uh, to try to consider those issues. Um, just to conclude, in terms of just a number of small uh, other technical issues not being touched upon. When, when you're just concluding, can, yeah. uh, the, one, the one thing I want to get, because one of the things that came through in the evidence was there's quite a number of the particip participants here today had concerns about the withdrawal bill. Uh, regarding the powers for ministers to make secondary legislation yeah. and the scrutiny issue. Now, we've got to, in the, in the last 10 minutes we've got left, we need to address that issue, otherwise we're going to have nothing on the record. So, uh, could you just deal with that now, Seraphin, in your closing remarks? Yes. And then I'll, then I'll go to a wider audience. Absolutely. I mean, in a way, we'll just refer on, on the scrutiny provisions that MEPs have at the moment on secondary legislation could be a good template that could be actually applied yeah. and introduced in the bill. And that will give uh, MSPs a wider say on whatever actions ministers or M MPs in London do in uh, regards to uh, issues of shared competence. Um, there are a number of other issues that, as, as the chair mentioned, as, uh, as, as technical issues. We, we would like to see more clarity on reporting obligations. This is outlined broadly aligned in the bill, but should be more clear. Issues about reciprocity, I mean, what happens with uh, waste shipping legislation. I mean, there are pieces of EU legislation that require both the EU and the UK to work, and that's particularly important for local government. Will the UK will report to a number of large uh, uh, goals like the EU energy package that is being currently uh, discussed uh, at the European level? There is also mentioned uh, uh, the issue of structural funds. It's not clear whether that rules will actually be included into the bill and they will have an effect on how monies are spent in the future. And finally, just a small reference to say, uh, if the Scottish and Welsh government agree, uh, managed to persuade the UK government that their amendments of the bill, whereby uh, Welsh and Scot Welsh Scottish Minister will not just be required to consult, but giving assents will be perhaps a de facto big constitutional change in the UK we haven't seen uh, in the last 40 years. Thank you. Seraphine. Right, the, the issue of the secondary legislation that Seraphin picked up there in terms of the scrutiny process, I know there was some organisations made comment upon that, so now is your chance to put something on the record. As well. uh, yeah, so I think as I kind of indicated earlier, we are quite concerned that at the moment the powers in the bill essentially mean that um, it will not be constrained to the purpose of faithful conversion of EU legislation, so in particular worried about the fact that there's no, um, it's not clearly defined what constitutes a technical or a non-technical change. Um, that deficiencies, the word deficiencies um, is not sufficiently limited. So there's kind of a list of, an illustrative list of what might constitute a deficiency, but it's not limited. And it's not clear whether, you know, there might be other examples that aren't included. Um, and again, that could lead to more substantive policy changes being carried out through those delegated powers. Um, and then... Um, so something that has kind of been floated, and we were very pleased to see that um, Minister Michael Russell yesterday um, mentioned that they're considering the kind of sift and scrutinise mechanism that's also been proposed down at Westminster. Um, that's something that uh, Green UK fully supports um, as a mechanism. So perhaps a time-limited parliamentary committee that could sift through some of the statutory instruments in order to identify which ones might um, necessitate um, an increased level of parliamentary scrutiny, where they might be considered a non-technical change. It's kind of a brief overview. It's quite clear as well. Thank you. Any other people want to pick up on that issue? No members? What, clear? Right, sorry, just um, add, yeah, I'd completely back up what you've said there. I think there needs to be um, a strengthened role for the Parliament here, because uh, that's clearly a major concern. Um, it seems as though the 
that the parliamentary committee structure has been somewhat bypassed um, in some of the drafting of the legislation, and there will be, or we would agree with recommendations being put forward for either a strengthened role of committees to decide where scrutiny of statutory legislation takes place, or indeed for a parliamentary committee structure to look at those statutory instruments just to give them better scrutiny. So. So a, a very, very quick observation. Um, in all this discussion, it, 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 it is interesting. We're trying to go towards, obviously, a much better system than we have already. And I think just want it be helpful if the committee bore that in mind, that for many areas of policy, certainly fishing, we're coming from a very, very bad area indeed. I'm not talking specifically secondary instruments, but a whole range of discretionary powers which are being exercised currently without any checks, balance or questioning at all. And so I think anything we can do better than that is certainly a great deal better than where we are at the moment. Kate, do you want to reflect on any of that at the end here? Daphne? I fully support what Isabel said. I think these are sort of jointly held positions. Um, we have also requested, I think, that the delegated powers conferred onto ministers across the UK are time limited to, to the two years um, and that any further changes from that point onwards to EU retained law needs to be made through primary legislation. Um, so that would be something quite important. Just on, on that uh, time-limiting period, if we are talking about a two-year transition period during which we are maintaining the status quo, is it two years? What, what, what happens during that during that transition period? It's a big uncertainty, and because at the end of that, it's only at that stage we actually need to make some of the may need to make some of the adjustments. So we could be talking about a four-year period if if it's two years of the status quo and then two years of transition. Time-limited, Okay. Thank you very, very much for everyone coming along this morning. We, as a committee, will be trying to draw a report together before the end of the year, and certainly an interim report, um, on our position on the legislative consent motion and a, a general report on the bill. So the contributions you made today will help us in that hugely. So I'm very, very grateful to everyone for coming along today. And uh, we now move into private session. Thank you very much.